And before we get into how machine learning works, uh, do you guys have any questions? Any questions? All right, so let's get into how machine learning works. So first, generally speaking, there is a typical pipeline for machine learning, uh, which, which actually com is composed of two main steps. First is training, <coughs> or also no, uh, known as model fitting. And then the second phase, as you can see here, is prediction. So after you build or train your model, you get it ready to work. Now you do the prediction. So training is actually our, uh, our, our model fitting is also composed of several sub, uh, sub uh, uh, problems, sub steps. So first thing is to uh, extract the features, uh, which is, if you, if you guys remember the, uh, for the data science, it's kind of similar to the exploratory data, exploratory, exploratory data analysis. So uh, sometimes you can actually have a problem, you know some of the, its features, but there is actually a, a, a more uh, a space for getting more, more nice features. I'll give you one of the, the projects that uh, we have here, uh, like a, in a collaboration with uh, George Mason University. Uh, we are trying to uh, build a model uh, that uses Meetup data. I mean, there is a, a, a website called meetup.com uh, where people can actually organize their meetings on. Uh, so we are trying to use data from this website along with some kind of uh, geographical data and uh, socioeconomic data to build, mix all those th things together to be able to predict in future if uh, what would be the best type of meetings or goals of meeting within this particular area. If such a meeting happens, what is the expected uh, number of attendees and so on and so forth. All right, so at the very stages, uh, very early stages of this, problem, of this uh, project, we actually worked on uh, extracting the features. What could be the good features, which is, can use, you can actually call this like using data mining. Uh, like for example, I mean, what is the average RSVP for each type of, uh, of, of each, each group? Okay, uh, what other information we can learn about the, uh, the types of people who attend those uh, events? Uh, the frequency of those events and so on and so forth. So given the data we have, the raw data we have, we are trying to pick up some of those features to use to be more meaningful for our model to learn. So that's feature extraction. Then we do what we call data processing. So data, pro data pre-processing. So in data pre-processing, we actually try uh, to take the raw form of data, or even the features, and make them, uh, put them in a, in a different format that actually matches the, the model. One of the simple cases here is if you have categorical problems. So, I mean, remember at the end of the day, uh, machine learning models deal with numbers. So if you have categories, let's say for example, uh, male and female, all right? So you have to encode this into a value that the model uh, understands, a numerical value. If you have, let's say for example, animals, let's say you try to uh, differentiate between cat and dog, you will have to interpret this or transform it into a value that the model understands and so on and so forth. Uh, and other actually types of pre-processing, we actually take the original values, the raw values, and uh, let's say for example, normalize them because that will actually make the model learns faster and so on and so forth. So this is what we call data pre-processing. And then we divide our data into uh, two main buckets, training and test. And the goal of that is we use the data, the training data to train our model, but we would like to evaluate how good this training was. And in order to do this in an unbiased way, we take a part of the data, which is usually maybe like 20%, 30%, 10%, depends on how much data you have, and set it aside and use it only to evaluate the model. And so why do we do this? Because if you train the model and then test it on a subset of this data, then this is actually a biased model, right? Like, like for example, if you, um, if, if you give me some a curricula to study, and then you teach me from exactly the same examples that you have taught me in this curricula, then probably I already remember the numbers, right? So the, it, this is not like a good evaluation of the model. That's why we set aside the test data and use it to evaluate our model. Um, and we actually, even it's, it's, uh, it's, it's even uh, more than this, that we do not use our evaluation of the test 
to guide our, our tuning to the training. In other words, because if we do this, then we will actually tune the training to be actually working best with the test case. But the, uh, this is not our goal. Our goal is actually to train a model that works best with the unseen data, which is if we, when, we, when we finish the training stage and put it into production, now this is what we are actually looking for. So you should, you should always keep the test data separated, isolated from, uh, uh, from being biased by the trained model. And to do this also, we actually sometimes uh, uh, split the training data into train and validation, because the fact of the matter is <clears throat> some of the uh, machine learning models will have uh, some kind of tuning knobs, tuning knobs, uh, like, like you can call them, uh, I mean, technically we do not call them parameters, we call them hyperparameters. Uh, uh, like for example, as we're going to see, uh, if, if you have heard about the uh, decision trees, uh, I mean, that's a tree, tree structure, and there is a depth of this tree structure. So what would be the depth that you are going to use for this problem? This is one of the hyperparameters for the model. So what is the depth? So in order to decide this, we actually use the validation set to work as if it's a test set for the training data. So that to decide which depth is going to be best for the training data. But I mean, this is beyond the scope here. I mean, just to give you just an idea that uh, what we do here. So we basically divide the data into training and test. Uh, and as we said, machine learning usually learns in an iterative uh, format. Uh, and after we do this, we evaluate our errors and do our error analysis and tune our model. And we keep doing this until we reach to the highest uh, um, training accuracy. Now, at this point, we can actually deploy our model into production. And in this case, I mean, as you can see in the figure uh, here, you use the model, pass it with new data, do the prediction, and produce the predicted data. <clears throat> so one of the major um, uh, types of, uh, of machine learning is what we call a linear machine learning models. And this is the simplest format of them. So as you can see here, uh, I mean, uh, uh, we pass the inputs, which is, I mean, after we have pre-processed them and put them in a numeric format, uh, let's say we have three uh, values. Sorry. So here, uh, the input data are x1, x2, until xn. We have n features. What we are trying to do here is to multiply each feature by a weight. This is the weight that we are trying to learn, all right? We are trying to learn those weights. Multiply each feature by a weight, and then add the bias, just in for, for like any, any kind of linear uh, equation, and produce an output y hat. And our goal is to train this model in, in a iterative way so that we can find an, the weights that will make the difference between y hat, which is the predicted output, and y, which is the original label, the, the minimum, right? So we do this by calculating the difference. We call this the cost function or loss function, the difference between y and y hat, and use this difference to update the weights uh, again and then continue, I mean, relearn again. Okay, so again, pass the data, multiply by the weights, calculate the predicted value, calculate the difference, and then based on this, we actually update, update our, our weights and keep doing this in iterations until we actually reach to the best calculation, the best accuracy uh, possible. We actually use here something called the learning rate, uh, which actually represents how much you, can, you would like to learn from each step. Because the fact of the matter is, if you make the learning rate so high, you actually you model can overshoot. Think about this like the following. Uh, you know when sometimes someone uh, like uh, we all go through experiences, right? If someone goes through an experience and starts to generalize very much from just one experience, right? The the uh, the the, the judgments will start to be very kind of uh, uh, restricted to this particular uh, case, and that will, uh, his their prediction is going to be very biased towards this. So you need to actually. Uh, update your learning rate. I mean, so for example, you can tell me, I mean, don't take so much, don't read in so much from this experience, right? That's why when you actually reduce your learning rate, you learn, yes, correct, but don't learn so much because we need to update. I mean, you need to go through other experiences in order to learn better. <coughs> uh, <clears throat> as we said, this type of, of models per uh, uh, the question that I was asked uh, before is not really explainable because at the end of the day, what you produce is a bunch of weights 
which does not really explain uh, why the model produces this. There is no real meaning behind that. But it actually turns out there are, there are some other machine learning models that are actually interpretable. Uh, like, for example, the decision trees. If you can see here, this figure is um, a decision trees that, uh, that shows um, how can we use information about a, um, a client for a bank in order to decide whether should we should he should they be given a credit for loan or not? So, for example, uh, you can first here we check if they are students or not. Then we check on the income. Then we check here for for example the age or the credit history and so on and so forth. And then at the end of the day, you see those brown leaf notes. They decide whether you should give them credit or give them loan or not. So, for this type of machine learning algorithms they are actually, I mean, interpretable. In other words, if you get a new client and then let it go through this tree and you end up with saying, yes, we should give them credit. You can know actually by backtracking because the, their age was something, was, let's say for was more than 40. Uh, their credit history was fair. Uh, their income was medium and they were not a student. Uh, so it seems I understand now why, what, what made actually the model predict that we should actually give them a loan. Another type of kind of, I mean, interpretable uh, uh, model, explainable models uh, is key nearest neighbor. In this model, we actually try to predict the prediction, make the prediction based on the closest uh, data samples we have. So if, if assuming we have two classes of data, as you can see, the stars and the uh, triangles, and we have this new data point, okay? If we take a circle of, I mean, uh, the circle that includes the closest three data samples to it, and then take the majority of them, then this means that I'm going to predict this as a triangle. If we take the closest seven examples here, then this means that I'm going to get uh, to classify this point as a star, not a triangle. Now, how can we actually find the best k? I mean, there are some kind of uh, algorithms to, I mean, trials to, that you can use to find the best k that will actually work better for your model. <coughs> Excuse me. So, as you have seen here, this, this structure, it actually lends itself to how the neurons in our brain works. As you can see here, the typical neuron has a body and receives signals from the, from the uh, other connected neurons with, through the dendrites and then produces an output that propagates further into the other connected neurons to the axons, right? If you can look at this, it looks very much like what we have just described a few slides ago, like we have inputs multiplied by weights and then produce an output and so on and so forth. So if we actually put a bunch of those together and, and connect them together and form like a bigger structure, then we have probably tried to simulate the structure of neurons. Again, even though we don't know so much, I mean, exactly how they work, but we are just trying to, we are inspired by them. Okay, so, I mean, this is actually, I mean, what, what have been actually inspiring those who have came up with the concept of neural networks, that they are trying actually to mimic that structure and let's see how it works. And it is actually that when we connect those neurons together in such a way, and there are so many structures, as we have said before, it turns out that this structure actually is capable of processing uh, much more complex problems. So as I said, an artificial neural network is capable of learning more complex and deeper, pro deeper problems through what we call nonlinearity. Because if we, if we look back here at the linear models, this is a linear equation. What we do here in, in, in neural networks is actually introduce something called an activation function, which actually, I mean, introduces some nonlinearity to the model, which actually gives it like more freedom to, uh, to learn complex problems. <coughs> And we actually, when this network gets like deeper, we call this deeper, uh, deep neural networks. Uh, those deep neural networks can be multi layers, uh, hundreds or even thousands. Uh, and each layer can have like so many nodes. And that's why you can expect why it actually needs a lot of computation power. Uh, again, it learns more complex problems. And what is even nice about them is that they can learn um, their own features. So if you remember here, we pass the features to this node, 
Now, when we put those features together, now this node has actually got, got the output, those are the input. Now this node gets the output of the, gets its input from the output of those previous nodes. Okay, so as the, the model of the of the, tree, the the neural networks learns, actually each layer would start to learn its own features. And we actually start to see some interesting features, not, even though it's not in every uh, type of network. So for example, here in this network, we pass an, an image of a human uh, to the network. And it seems that the first layer of the network actually learns edges, as you can see here. Now, the output of that is passed to the next layer, and it seems that the next layer actually can learn combination of edges, like, for example, eyes, nose, ears, and stuff like this. And then the next layer can lay, learn more complex uh, uh, things, like object models, like a type of faces, not actually a particular face, and so on and so forth. <coughs> so as we said, when we use, when we deal with neural networks or deep networks, we can actually eliminate the need for feature extraction. Um, there are many structural patterns for the uh, deep neural networks. Uh, for example, the convolution neural networks, which is basically used for image processing, uh, the recurrent neural networks, which is basically used for sequence models. Uh, and we're going to talk about the sequence models in a, in a couple of slides. Uh, this is, I mean, an example of the convolution of neural networks. Uh, it's actually, I mean, without going into so much details, but this, as I said, it's basically used to process images. So you pass an image as a set of pixels and you start uh, applying some filters uh, on those images until you produce an output. Let's say, for example, in this here, we pass it a number, like a handwriting number, and we would like to guess which digit it is, like from zero to nine. So we have 10 classes here. Um, the recurrent neural networks, which, as I said, uh, are used to deal with the sequence models. So one of the sequences, uh, the examples that we have seen so far, uh, so for example, the, um, uh, the housing problem, you have a bunch of features, number of bedrooms, bathrooms, and stuff like this. All of those types of uh, features, they are not dependent on each other. Now, in some cases, for example, when you have text, when you have musical notes, when you have words, those, I mean, in order to understand what's there and deal with it, you will have to deal with this as a sequence. So, I mean, in order to understand the fifth word, you need to understand what was meant in the previous words and so on and, forth, and so on and forth. And sometimes actually you need to understand the first based on the, on the, on the second or maybe the nth uh, word. I mean, it's actually both directions. So this is where we need to use those recurrent, recurrent neural networks to process those sequences. <coughs> So examples here are text summarization, uh, um, chatbots. I mean, to be able to understand what's there, you need to understand that uh, um, in order to respond to an, an answer to a, to a question, you need to understand what's there. And it's actually, there's a lot of work now in the industry on the chatbots uh, for the customer support and stuff like this to save the time and, and make the responses like uh, faster. <coughs> This is an example for a sentiment analysis. Uh, so you put the, uh, you give the sequence uh, again of, of words and the, uh, the output of that is going to be whether, for example, this was uh, like a good review or a bad review. Other examples of the sequence models are uh, speech recognition, uh, maybe music generation. So you pass uh, an input as just one uh, simple and uh, like a starting simple and let the model generate uh, uh, music with a certain genre, for example. Uh, simple classification, as we said, like the, uh, uh, you, you classify or to predict uh, what was the, uh, uh, the, the rating of that that was meant by this review. Uh, DN sequence analysis, uh, DNA sequence analysis, a machine translation. So the input here, I mean, input and output are, can be actually different length because you don't use typically the same number of words to make the same statement in different languages. Uh, video activity recognition. So like given a video, which is a bunch of frames, how can you know what is the activity that's being executed here? And so on and so forth. <coughs> so now, so far we have the, uh, talked about deep learning versus machine learning. And we said that deep learning is like that, that connected structure of uh, neurons. Um, so what's the difference between them? Uh, as you can see here, I mean, Deep learning, because we have a bigger structure, it usually needs more, uh, more data to learn. Uh, 
why the simple machine learning models, um, which is like one node, they usually are capped, the performance are capped because they can't do much more um, uh, processing just like uh, the deep neural networks. And they are not very flexible like the deep uh, neural networks. Another major uh, uh, difference is the feature extraction. As I said, in deep neural networks, the model actually can extract or can learn its, feature, uh, its, uh, its uh, features, uh, which is different from the typical machine, simple machine learning models. Uh, in order to evaluate our models, we typically use <coughs> some measurements, uh, like the precision we call uh, specificity uh, uh, and the sensitivity. I guess people who work in the medical and biological field, they, they are more familiar with what's called the sensitivity and specificity, uh, particularly, for example, the uh, uh, tests like COVID tests and stuff like this, we are more familiar with those. So we use actually those measurements to uh, evaluate our models. Uh, one of the main things that we, uh, as I mentioned before, we do with our models is uh, uh, pre-processing and data feed. So uh, as I said, one of the uh, pre-processing phases or operations that we apply to our data uh, can be actually meant to uh, Speed up our uh, speed up the model how, how the model work uh, the rate of the, the model learns like for example normalizing our features um, if you can see here this is like uh, sometimes your, your features are actually not very normalized they are very kind of uh, spread over like a big range of data so you just need to normalize this data uh, this uh, this data in order to make it normalize the features in order to make the model works better and as you're going to see with Kristen in a, in a few minutes. Uh, there are already, I mean, uh, some built-in tools that can do this for you. Uh, the data feed, which means that how much data you feed to the model to learn every iteration. So remember, we said machine learning learns through iterations. So you can actually feed all your data to the model to learn every iteration. Because this, remember, we update the weights every iteration. So the next time the model is going to see the data, it will have actually a different set of weights and will keep updating this until it actually reach to the best accuracy. But if your data is so much, then feeding or training the data, your, your model with all the data every iteration can be actually very costly. So, uh, which is actually, this is what we call batch uh, uh, data, <coughs> we look, which means that we use all the data every iteration. Uh, the other side of that is to use only one data sample if you iteration, but the problem with that is the learning is going to be very rugged like this, this kind of uh, what we call stochastic uh, gradient descent is one of the, the, the optimization techniques we use to find the solution. But there is actually a middle ground, which is uh, what we call many batch uh, uh, solutions where we actually take batches, let's say, for example, 32, 64, 128, data samples every time, which is what is actually more used in the, in, in the industry and research. We also do something called tuning, uh, uh, which is actually has the goal of speeding up and improving the accuracy. For example, the learning rate that I have mentioned before. And one of the main things that is very important in, in training machine learning is uh, uh, to prevent the model from overfitting. So what is overfitting? Simply, <coughs> When you have someone learn so much and sticking so much for the experiences that they, they pass through, I mean, which is kind of hard-minded, this is what we mean by overfitting. As you, if you can see here in the, the example on the far right, uh, we're trying to build a decision boundary between the two examples here, two classes of examples, right? If you actually pass the, the decision boundary very sharply, I mean, including only the points that belong to each one, it probably, I mean, will, I mean, yes, it will classify the training data very correctly, but it will not be very generalizable to the reality because the reality is this can actually, those two data samples can actually be kind of an outliers or maybe mistakes. So uh, on the other hand, if you just uh, be like underfitting, which is if you just be very relaxed, you don't actually take things superficially and just draw a line, you be you would be missing a lot. So the appropriate fitting is you, for, for here, for this example, is probably if we do something like that. I mean, you just assume that those data points are an outliers or mistakes and just uh, rely on this. That would be give you more generalization in future because generalization 
is actually at the end of the day, the goal. We would like to build a model that works in reality, not only works on our training data. And finally, um, uh, what about the data? Again, if you remember, I said that uh, one of the things that is a major problem in machine learning is to find labeled data. Uh, so how much data you have can actually define uh, or decide which uh, model, machine learning or deep learning model you, you need, you can use. But the, 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 the good thing is that there is a lot of online resources that can provide you with images or actually data that you can deal with. One of them is called Kaggle, if you have heard about it before. It's a repository for data for many different disciplines, many different fields that you can use to train your data, your models. But actually, when, when your problem is very specific, probably you will not find the images or the right data there. For example, that, that uh, project that Chris and I are working on, uh, we actually needed to find similar data for plots captured by drones, but the types of images that we are working on are very specific to a specific crop and a specific height and so on and so forth. We could not find such data. So we're actually limited with the small amount of data that we have. But another solution that you can do in order to improve or increase the number of, data, of images or data you have uh, could be through data augmentation. So data augmentation means that you introduce some changes to your uh, uh, data so that it will look like a new set of data. But you try to do this in, in a very realistic way as much as possible. Like for example here, <coughs> We have this picture of a butterfly. So what can we do? We can actually detextualize the image because remember, your model would need to learn uh, on the samples that we present the distribution that we will you will get the data from in reality. So if, for example, if you le teach or learn your model based on very high quality images, but you end up with deploying this model in reality in an environment where all the data you will receive will have a lot of distortions, a lot of noise, then, I mean, it's, it's kind of, I mean, uh, you just wasted your time. You need to get the model trained on the type of data that you expect to see, okay? So the model can actually learn on, as we can see here, actually on different variations of the original model, because there could be some types of images that, that you can receive. Again, one of those examples is if, if your image that you expect to see is actually very low in quality. So you need to pass your model, train your model with low quality images to be able to differentiate it. Our models like, like humans need to learn on the good and bad as well. And then the, the good examples, the correct examples and the bad examples as well. So we can uh, decolorize it. We can uh, uh, flip, rotate, uh, <coughs> take actually uh, random plots of the image and so on and so forth. Um, uh, one of the examples that I was working on, we, we, we uh, were doing indoor localization, <clears throat> which means we were trying to guess your location based on uh, the, um, the network packets you receive from the surrounding network devices like your, uh, your routers. Uh, so we, we do this through the signal strength we receive your, 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 your phone number, your, I'm sorry, your phone, uh, your mobile phone uh, can detect from the signals that it receives, okay? So based on this, we can train a model to know where are you based on these uh, 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 measurements. But the idea is um, we didn't, I mean, we didn't have enough data like that. So one of the, the augmentation techniques that we have followed is probably we can drop some of the uh, of the received data, received the uh, signal strength or packets, so that we can actually try to imitate some of the natural uh, uh, impacts or the natural effects that we can find because we, because we are inside an indoor environment. So anyway, I mean, the, what I'm what I'm trying to say here is we can use a lot of a lot of ways to increase our data. One of the projects that Kristen is working on uh, is also includes. Um, uh, working on uh, doing some classification based on text, okay, text uh, uh, that describes garments. So we actually are working, or Kristen and his team are working on producing or increasing this data by augmenting the data because we don't have so many of those. Uh, so we're trying to come up with some variations of these uh, text descriptions to uh, increase the data set and make their training better. And finally, one of the uh, important ways in order to make your, uh, to get your data model work is what we call uh, transfer learning. So what is transfer learning? Uh, and in many cases, it turns out that uh, 
there are so many people who have tried to solve the same problem uh, like the one that you have solved before. <clears throat> so for example, let's say that someone, some team have tried to uh, work on uh, animal uh, pictures. Let's say like, let's say dog pictures, okay? And now you would like to build a model that will differentiate or actually work with cat pictures. So cat and dogs are different, but there is some similarities. So you can actually take the model and then retrain part of it. Because if you remember from this picture, here at the very early layers, your model were actually trying to learn some abstract things. All right, so edges are an abstract thing. A uh, combination of edges, edges is an abstract thing and it can be actually the same thing between a cat and dog. But probably here, the object models can be different between a cat and dog. So what you can do is actually take part of the early part of the model and then just train the late or the uh, very last layers of the model. This is what we call uh, transfer learning. And it actually saves you a lot of time and also it makes you need your data less because you already have trained a good part of the network. <clears throat> so finally, when to use machine learning versus that uh, deep learning, uh, first, it depends on how complex in your problem. There are actually some nice models, simpler models that can take, uh, they can solve your problem, like support vector machines and kernels. Um, also depends on how much data you have. But at the end of the day, I mean, even though if you have a small amount of data, your problem can be very complex and actually needs deep learning. And in this case, you probably will need to work on bringing data. You more data and always think about transfer learning uh, because it will save you a lot of time and effort to collect data. <clears throat> Before I, I show some of the twisting applications of uh, machine learning, do you guys have any questions so far? Any questions? All right, done. <clears throat> so some of the applications of machine learning include uh, stock prices. If you remember housing prices, stock prices can be something different, uh, similar to that. But uh, actually, I mean, uh, you will need to think uh, uh, carefully about what features can contribute to the impact of, of uh, stock, or stock prices, because that will include a lot of things. I mean, you guys are probably following the uh, stock prices now because of the news about the, the war between Russia and Ukraine, and this is all uh, this is definitely impacting the stock prices now, which is something probably cannot be predicted. But there are some, maybe some other factors that can actually uh, exist and normally exist in the, the environment and can impact the stock prices. Uh, weather forecasts, uh, I mean, this is also another field where deep learning is actually uh, 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 used heavily in. In the medical field, it's actually used uh, now the more they get uh, to be able to use the electronic medical records, because you know that one of the major hurdles in using the medical records is the regulations, because it's a heavily regulated industry. So, I mean, the more they get, the, the, they, get uh, they become able to use the medical records, the more they will become able to uh, process this data and be able to actually diagnose um, uh, uh, diseases. So this is an example of uh, IBM Watson. So IBM has uh, their own uh, AI uh, uh, engine called uh, Watson. And uh, I'll show you like a small video from here how this uh, gentleman from IBM describes how the uh, engine actually uh, deals with and uses the medical records to make a diagnosis for a cancer. So now the first thing a physician will do is validate all of the information for this patient. And once it's verified, then what Watson can do is bring up the various treatment options. So Watson isn't winging it, right? It's the, the physician is part of this process. No, so now what's happening is um, in addition to Watson reading through the electronic health record and figuring out what's relevant for this patient in the context of cancer care, what Watson also has been loaded with is 15 million pages of medical literature. And, and it's been trained on thousands of cases uh, that have been curated so Watson can understand um, the right treatment for these individuals. <coughs> and so as it went through this process, it basically brought up the treatment options now specific to this individual. 
and there's there's essentially three sets of options. Uh, there's recommended, generally good in any circumstance, that's green. There's yellow, which is for consideration, could very well be a good option, but there may be something that you need to explore, like a comorbidity, just as one example. Or red, generally not recommended, could be a contraindicated uh, 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 treatment option. And so, so as you could see, uh, the model was trained on uh, cases as well as was actually equipped with uh, uh, literature, like 15 million literature uh, uh, pieces about cancer. So, I mean, it has been very well trained and it can actually um, uh, produce like a very high, highly accurate uh, prediction or diagnosis of uh, the patient given their own the information as well. Of course, I mean, the internet has, is a big field for using uh, for uh, the uh, using machine learning and artificial intelligence. And as I said at the beginning, the targeted ads is one of, the, of those. I mean, it uses your information to predict which ads will be uh, suiting you. The recommended systems, there are the trigger words. If you haven't heard about the trigger words, this is, for example, when you say, uh, hey Siri or hey Google, or I mean, stuff like this and Alexa, uh, these are called trigger words. The problem with those is, uh, uh, they need to be uh, captured by, by, I mean, the, the application, which is Siri or, or Alexa, needs to be able to respond to you once it hears it. But the idea here is that we have different voices, we have different pitches, we have different dialects, we have even different backgrounds. So if, if a person with a dialect like me say, hey, Alexa, it can be different from like British English versus American English versus European English, I mean, so on and so forth. And in addition to that, let's say that I'm driving my car and, uh, and, uh, and uh, there is a lot of noise around me. It actually needs to be able also to capture the word, the trigger word and respond given this noise. If I'm sitting next to a train, uh, it needs to be able to capture this and so, uh, and so on and so forth. Image sensor is one of the interesting things that I usually use for my presentations. So if you can notice through all these slides, <coughs> I include the link to where I get those pictures from. And the way actually I found this picture is through image, Google image search. So I just type, let's say, for example, the uh, supervised learning, and it actually brings me a lot of pictures that shows, I mean, supervised learning. I mean, if you go to uh, images.google.com, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a nice source for those. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Fraud and security and cybersecurity and stuff like this. Uh, it's also another field for um, uh, for the good and bad, all right? If you have probably heard about the, uh, the deep fake, where you can actually superimpose uh, words or speech on the tongue or the face of someone, and it looks very natural, it's very, very dangerous, actually. So let's see this example. We're entering an era in which our enemies can make it look like anyone is saying anything at any point in time. Jordan Peele created this fake video of President Obama to demonstrate how easy it is to put words in someone else's mouth. Moving forward, we need to be more vigilant with what we trust from the internet. Not so, as you can see, uh, you can actually put the words in, on the tongue of uh, President Obama, which is uh, kind of very dangerous. Uh, so actually, I mean, the, the applications of artificial intelligence and, and images and videos is very, very advanced now. Uh, and one of the actually uh, very interesting ones is the car driving, uh, the autonomy, the self-driving cars. It's uh, kind of moving forward, even though it's slower than expected. If you probably, uh, I mean, guys are aware about the five levels of autonomy that self-driving cars are supposed to get in order to be completely autonomous. There are five levels. Five is the highest. And so far, we have been only in the second level, even though what I have heard is that Mercedes have, got, have been approved for third level of autonomy in, in, in Germany. And third level of autonomy means that um, the second level of autonomy is that if you put the car on self on uh, uh, autopilot, you will have to stay putting your hands and I mean sitting in front in the in front of the uh, driving wheel and putting your hand. The second, the third level, I guess you don't have to put your hands on the on the driving wheel. So there is a lot of problems, a lot of problems with uh, uh, with uh, uh, with uh, self driving cars that they have to actually uh, avoid. And uh, <clears throat> still, there is a lot of actually questions here. Like, for example, if an accident happened, this was an accident that uh, you see here. Uh, if you can see my screen. Let's see. 
schema screen here. This is a self-driving car. This uh, incident was, happened in 2018. Uh, a self-driving car uh, that actually hit a pedestrian, which was a kind of a peculiar case. The pedestrian was walking with the bicycle next to them, and it was night, and probably he, they were passing on over the uh, uh, pedestrian area. So it was kind of a very peculiar case. That's why, I mean, the models need to be very well trained in all sorts of cases. And uh, the problem happens here is that from an ethical and regulatory uh, point of view is, uh, uh, the problem is uh, if something like that happens, whose responsibility is going to be? Is it the driver? Is this the manufacturer of the car? Or is it the person who wrote the code for the car? I mean, so there's a lot of things that needs to figure out. So there's a lot of work in the regulations here. Similarly, of course, uh, the same, th same thing applies to the uh, uh, flying drones and stuff like this. Art, uh, <clears throat> if you can see, I mean, this model is a very nice application when you can actually use a content image and a style image and actually produce automatically an image that is styled with one thing. So, I mean, same thing apply applies to the... Uh, music generation and stuff like this. So it's one of actually the nice applications of uh, machine learning. Uh, natural language processing, uh, one of the very, I mean, uh, advanced areas of applications of machine learning. And let's see this video. This video was from a Google I.O. conference in 2018. So that's almost three and a half years. Okay, and you're going to see now how far they have reached with uh, their natural language understanding applications. Hi, I'm calling to book a woman's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. It turns out a big part of getting things done is making a phone call. We think AI can help with this problem. Let's say you want to ask Google to make you a haircut appointment on Tuesday between 10 and noon. What happens is the Google Assistant makes the call seamlessly in the background for you. So what you're gonna hear is the Google Assistant actually calling a real salon to schedule the appointment for you. Let's listen. Oh, how can I help you? Hi, I'm calling to book a woman's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me more that's it. Mm hmm. Or what time are you looking for around? At 12 p.m. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 1.15. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would like, what service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's your first name? The first name is Lisa. Okay, perfect. So I will see Lisa at 10 o'clock on May 3rd. Okay, great. Thanks, great. Have a great day. Bye. So as you can see, it's very smoothly res uh, responding and interacting with the, with the person on the other side. But the, the, the next, I mean, the next uh, example here, as we continue this, uh, this video, you would see like a more see uh, how more advanced it becomes. Sorry. Hi. Hey, great. Have a great day. thing is the assistant can actually understand the nuances of conversation. We've been working on this technology for many years. It's called Google Duplex. It brings together all our investments over the years in natural language understanding, deep learning text-to-speech. By the way, when we are done, the assistant can give you a confirmation notification saying your appointment has been taken care of. Let me give you another example. Let's say you want to call a restaurant, but maybe it's a small restaurant which is not easily available to book online. The call actually goes a bit differently than expected. So take a listen. Yeah, may I hear you? Hi, um, I'd like to reserve a table for Wednesday the 7th. For seven people? Um, it's for four people. Four people when? Um, Wednesday at 6 p.m. 
Oh, actually, we need to go like after like five people, four people, four people you can come. How long is the wait usually to uh, be seated? For when tomorrow or weekday or? For next Wednesday, uh, the seventh. Oh no, it's not too busy. It's, it's, you can come for four people, okay? Oh, I got gotcha. you. Thanks. Okay. Bye -bye. So as you can see, I mean, uh, now the conversation is happening with a, a person with a dialect uh, like me, and it actually can respond and uh, detect what is being said. That's why I said, folks, when you need, when you train your model, you need to train it on what it actually it, it is supposed to see in reality, not only. Uh, Uh, not only the uh, things that you you have in your data, you should you should train it on the reality, on on what is supposed to see. Finally, limitations and risks of machine learning. <clears throat> One of the main things in machine learning is the main problem is bias. Uh, so you can have bias in your data, and when we say bias in your data, meaning that uh, at the end of the day, your model is going to learn from the data, like when you learn from your experience. Uh, but your model is, I can confirmably say that it's not smart like you. So um, if you model, if the data you have uh, is actually uh, converted or actually collected from, uh, or actually have some bias towards people of color or against people of color, uh, I mean, against some gender stuff like this, your model is going to work like this. I remember in one of the uh, presentations in a conference, um, the, uh, the presenter was actually showing that uh, when they trained a model to capture uh, with, with pictures of people cooking, all right, it turns out that the model will always de uh, detect or guess that the person in the image is always, I'm not sure if it's man, a man or a woman. And, and it turns out that it was doing this. This is actually one of the examples of how they were doing for, for that example, for that question about explainability. They were trying to explain why it always brings this like that. It was, it, it turns out that the model will always um, was connecting the kitchen with the people. So it turns out it has some bias because most of the pictures with kitchen, it was men or women, I can't remember, all right? So if you have bias in your data, you need to fix that. Uh, you, you also have to, you need to make sure that your model inside, inside I mean, the, the, how the model is actually uh, built also does not have bias. One of the nice examples here is, uh, <coughs> just a risk, is uh, that case in, in Facebook that happened a few years ago where um, uh, they were trying to train a chat bot to do bargaining, all right? And they had Alice and Bob, they were trying to, uh, to need to be trained. And uh, what was funny is that uh, the, the agents of the models actually built uh, their own language and started to converse in something that they can respond to each other, but nobody have, could understand back to the explainability. And actually Facebook had to shut down this project because they ended up not being able to, I mean, to deal with this. Let me show the... Uh... Mm, here, Facebook shuts down robots after they invent their own language. That was 2017. So that was just one of the the nice examples of what what risks can be in people are now talking about the um, the risks of uh, developing robots that can actually like be kind of uh, war robots because you don't know I mean how they are going to do this uh, I mean that the, the concept of ethics is not something that they can learn even though I mean in this conference that Kirsten and, and I were were uh, I mean a couple of days ago I mean there was a lot of thing a lot of discussion a complete track in the conference about AI ethics and how can we actually train the models about the concept of ethics. All right. Uh, all right, so that's what I have. Uh, we will take a break now for five minutes and then come back where Kristen can actually walk you through uh, Orange, that prototyping tool that you can use to build like prototypes for machine learning without writing code. We will uh, be, uh, let's be back at uh, 11, 11.06. Is that okay, uh, Alessandro? I hope everyone is back. Uh, now, Kristen, uh, my, my, my colleague is going to start the, the code theme, the uh, tutorial on Orange. Uh, to you, Kristen. 
Okay, thank you very much, Amr. Uh, let's see, my mute. Yes, can you hear me all right? Yes. Awesome. Yeah. So yeah, this is the section of the workshop where we get together hands into something. Uh, we chose to use orange because it's a wonderful uh, tool with a low learning curve. Uh, the next slide, please. So the, the tutorial I'm going through today was adapted uh, from a book by Jason Brownlee, who he is an author of um, applied machine learning books. And he does a wonderful job in explanation. He has so many online tutorials on many different machine learning and deep learning topics. For example, if I ever have a question about something in this field, I search for machine learning mastery first to see if he has something. Um, but this book he wrote was using a software, another open so source software called Weka. This learning curve for that one is a little bit more involved. Uh, so we adapted it for Orange. Next slide. So what is Orange? It is a visual coding uh, through these uh, little interactive widgets on a canvas blank canvas you'll see here in a moment. And it's a way that you can, allows you to do machine learning algorithms without any coding experience. And it's been around for a number of years, so it's very mature. Uh, next slide. And so roughly speaking, what we're going to do today is we're gonna load up a data set, which uh, everyone should have had access to its a uh, diabetes data set and do some analysis on it. Uh, we're going to perform a suite of different algorithms, uh, machine learning algorithms to see which ones perform the best. And then we're going to show you how to finalize and save your models and load them for future data. 